I'm back with Jane Wenning, and Jane is a certified medical technologist with a degree in clinical laboratory science. Um, she's an athletic trainer and health mentor, and she helps women improve their mental and physical health for over 20 years. So we've been talking about these four pillars, Jane, recovery, emotional energy, nutrition, and movement. And we've talked about, you know, how you can make changes to them and the weak pillars and the strength and pillars and so forth. But, you know, what happens if you want to make changes to all the pillars at one time? Is it overwhelming or should you just tackle one at a time and make these little small hacks that you were talking about? No, that's a great question. I think sometimes people get really zealous about wanting to make changes and so they want to make a bunch of changes. And that's where the science person in me comes out and says, you know what, we we need to look at one variable at a time and make changes that way so that we're not overwhelmed, so that we can get these little wins and that will give us the momentum for greater wins. So again, on my website, there is a survey that people can take that will give them an idea of which of their pillars might need to be strengthened first. And sometimes, Gail, when you strengthen, you might not even realize that that was a weak pillar. And when you strengthen that pillar, it will kind of float over into the other pillars and strengthen them at the same time. Yeah, because so everything I, is really connected, I guess. You know, I mean, when you start one thing, it kind of rolls over to something else. And uh, just like you were talking about getting the right sleep and so forth, if you get the right sleep, it's going to allow you to recover faster and have better emotional energy and so forth. So uh, I can see where, you know, even these small steps that you're suggesting can make a big difference in, in the various pillars. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, another example is, again, I'm going to start with the, the recovery um, pillar. If you use a technique called myofascial release, uh, using a foam roller and kind of massage out your muscles and um, keep those, those knots at bay, then when you're sleeping at night, you can get better quality of sleep. And then when you have that better quality of sleep, of sleep, it allows you to have clearer thinking. So again, you are able to handle those daily stresses better. You're able to make better food choices. And if you don't have those aches and pains in your body, then you can move your body. Yeah, you know, um, it's funny you mentioned the foam rollers. I always uh, saw people at the gym working with these foam rollers. And then I would get the foam rollers and somehow... I just didn't know what I was doing. I mean, even even when I was trained by a trainer and so forth, it just seemed so foreign to me. And um, I really was the person who every day worked out. I mean, I didn't work out, you know, like a like a banshee, but I did do my. I was doing two hours a day. I would do an hour of weight training and so forth, and then I would take a class for an hour. And then when the gym shut down. I would just do my own thing in my own apartment because the gyms, even in my building, uh, were closed. So uh, it was learning what to do and uh, doing it faithfully that made the big difference. So I'm finding that more difficult for me now is the sleep portion. And um, so I've, I've kind of made up for it by taking these naps during the day. But uh, since most of us think health is very overwhelming, and not over, only overwhelming, Jane, but confusing. I mean, there's so much material out there now with the Internet and so forth. How do you know where to start? I mean, I know you said recovery is the most important pillar as far as you're concerned. So I'm assuming you would start with that. But, I mean, how do you know where to start and what to do? Well, that's a good question. Again, you know, if people want to take that quick survey that I have on my website, they can see which pillar for them might need strengthening. And maybe they are sleeping well, and that's not, that's not a place where they need to start. But maybe they are not handling stress well. Maybe they've got toxic people in their life. Because, Gail, you know, just because somebody is in our inner circle, they are not always in our corner. And we have people like that in our lives that we need to push out of our square and to the outskirts of our inner circle. 
so that we can live a little more stress-free. We can breathe a little easier without those people um, being so toxic, so close to us. So taking that survey and then deciding for yourself which of these pillars need to be strengthened, that's, that's important because we are all different and we are all in a different place in life and we should not be treated like a pair of pantyhose. It is not a one-size-fits-all deal. We need to start with where we are and we can all start today. We don't even have to wait till tomorrow. We can start right now today with making health a habit, putting ourselves first and deciding which pillar do I need to start on and make those baby steps. And sometimes they're going to feel like sideways steps. But as long as you are making steps, you are making progress to better health. You know, it's it's interesting. I did a whole show um, just this past week on stressors and stress. And I talked about how stress is the amount of wear and tear on your body and how there are stressors in your life that you don't even realize are repetitive. And some of them are situations and some of them are people. And I said, the thing that you need to do is every time you feel a, I call it a, you know, that comes into your life, whenever that happens, write down the situation or write down the person that is making it happen. And you're going to find out it's not a lot of people that cause you stress. It's the same people over and over again. Now, some of them you can't eliminate. Uh, from your life, but if they're family members, that's more difficult. And on the other hand, uh, there are sometimes situations that you put yourself into that are stressors. And if you don't do that, if you eliminate those kinds of situations from your life, you're going to find yourself living a much more positive and uh, uh, happier life. So um, where is your position in terms of, of how you handle people and situations that cause you stress? Oh gosh, that's such a great, great question. First thing, you have to be aware. You have to be aware when somebody, whether it is a family member, a friend, a coworker, that causes you to feel anxious or frustrated or angry, you have to be aware of that emotion. And you have two parts of your brain. You have the emotional part of your brain and the problem, problem solving part of your brain. So what you want to do, Gail, is you want to turn off that emotional part of your brain and turn on the problem solving part of your brain by starting to ask yourself questions. Why am I so angry or frustrated? What can I do to become less angry or frustrated? And then one of the things that I like to give my clients to do, I like to ask them when they're in a situation like this to journal. And yes, it might be a good idea to journal what um, habits or what situations are causing that problem because we all know what we, what, we, um, what we measure, we can make changes to. If we never measure it, if we never write it down, we can't make changes to it. But the other thing that I like to ask my clients to do when they feel in a situation like this is to take out their journal and start journaling everything they're grateful for, from the smallest thing to the, to the biggest thing, everything they're grateful for. And, and if it happens to be a friend or a family member, journal what you're grateful for this person about. Because Gail, you cannot be angry and grateful. You cannot be negative and grateful at the same time. So it automatically disrupts that pattern of anger, of negativity, of anxiety, and it puts you in a completely different mind space of gratitude. You know, it's interesting. Of course, it's harder to do when they're family members and they're, it's harder to do if they're family members who live with you. So, you know, there's, there's all those other circumstances that come uh, in, in involved as well. However, that's one of the reasons why I think it's so important to have stress reducers. Now, in my particular case, it was always exercise. It was always the animals that I had in my life. Um, and to this day, it's the same thing. I mean, 
uh, I I just uh, totally I always laugh and I say I've got I had three children too I have two living children and uh, I always said you know I had three kids five dogs and three cats and I would much rather have gotten all the dogs and cats lined up doing a dance than worry about the three kids because they were much more trouble. <laughs> uh, in in reality, I mean you know uh, there are certain people in your life that you cannot do anything about. And you, some of them, as I say, you live with, and some of them might even be uh, your family. I mean, in terms of mom and dad, uh, many of the people our age, Jane, uh, probably more your age than my age, have parents that they're caring for as well. And, and they're referred to as the sandwich generation because they're taking care of adult children and they're taking care of their elderly parents as well. And uh, that is a stressful situation in itself. You know what? It absolutely is. And I can relate because I am until 2019, I was part of that sandwich generation. Sadly, both of my parents passed away in 2019. But what I found to help me when I had to deal with my parents and my mom lived with me for a time, I had to create a safe space in my house a space where all of my family members knew when I was sitting in this chair, in this room, this is my space and you you give me my space and you don't come in and talk to me. When I am ready to come out and greet the world again, then you can talk to me. But when I am in this space, you you have to give me some grace. You have to give me some compassion and let me have my time. And I recommend that even to my young adult children that are living in apartment situations where the accommodations are pretty tight and they've got a roommate. I said, I've told them that it's very important that you have somewhere in that apartment a space where you can be all by yourself, even if it means that you are facing a corner in your chair with your headphones on, you have to create that quiet, safe space to disconnect from all the things that bring you stress. I so agree with you in that. And, uh, you know, it takes on different ways, shapes and forms for different people, but uh, it's having that safe space is so important. And the fact that people honor it is even more important because there are some people that would just barge in anyway. And those, of course, are your stressors. <laughs> those are your people <laughs> who are causing you stress in your day. So absolutely. You know, but I'm I'm curious also, you brought up something earlier and maybe you don't want to talk about it because uh, you don't have enough information, but the circadian, uh, circadian rhythms, uh, what impact does that have? Oh, gosh, I love all the things that are coming out now about the circadian rhythm. So first of all, and this might also help some of your listeners who are having a problem sleeping. A good night's sleep doesn't start when you go to bed at night. It starts when you wake up in the morning because we have photoreceptors in our eyes and on our skin. So if you can get morning sunlight on your eyes and on your skin, 10, 15 minutes a day. Now, this can't be filtered through a window because there's there's the whatever the coating they use on windows that will block that. And if we have screens on, then that it's amazing how much sunlight can be filtered through those screens. So just getting outside and getting sunlight on your eyes or in your eyes and on your skin will help to reset your circadian rhythm. And what they're also finding now is that the timing of your meals will help to reset your circadian rhythm. A lot of us have gotten into a habit of eating all night long. Maybe we delay eating in the morning, but we eat until almost the time we go to bed at night. And when we're feeding our bodies like that, we're telling our bodies, okay, I've got something coming up that I need energy for. So be on alert, be on call. And then we try and lay down and go to sleep. And here again is where that parasympathetic side comes into play. Because the parasympathetic side again is where we rest and digest. But we can't do both of them equally well at the same time. Our body cannot repair and recover when it's trying to digest. So 
if we follow us more of a circadian rhythm with our eating pattern and when the sun starts to go down that's when we stop eating that also will clue our body into okay i'm not obtaining any more energy so i need to kind of be shutting down for the day so that's kind of how the circadian rhythm just with sunlight and food can make a big impact on our health you know it's so funny that you talk about these two issues because first of all i've always been a person who loves uh the sunlight and so uh, living in florida that's been a big help as you know with your 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 home that you have on the west coast of florida uh it you just have much more sunshine here than you do up north and when it's a gray day i'm in a gray mood and when it's a sunshiny day i just love it so i agree with you on that and then the other thing that has changed with me is i no longer well i never ate late i never i was just never a late eater but now i have a meal at four or five and I really don't eat past six o'clock because I find that it weighs much too heavy on my stomach. I don't sleep well and uh, I don't feel well. And if I have a light meal at four or five, and it's interesting, isn't it, that here in the United States, we eat our heaviest meal at night, whereas in Europe, they eat their heaviest meal during the day, uh, you know, for lunch. Uh, and it, it just makes a big difference. And I find that as long as I don't eat past four or five o'clock, I do pretty well in the sleep area. So what you're saying with the circadian rhythm uh, definitely works, I think. Gail, you're already doing it. But okay, so here's one thing that they say with our meal times. And when I say they, I mean people that are into health, not necessarily um, what the mainstream media would say that we should our breakfast, which doesn't necessarily need to be at six o'clock in the morning and it doesn't necessarily need to be um, breakfast cereal. All it means is that you're breaking your overnight fast. So maybe it comes at eight, maybe it comes at nine, but your breakfast, whenever you break that overnight fast, you should eat like a king. Your midday meal should be eating like a queen and your evening meal should be eating like a pauper. Yeah, I've heard that, you know, and, and as I say, I think the European and the Scandinavian countries, et cetera, do much better at that than we do. For some reason, uh, we uh, we here in the United States have always had dinner time as being the big meal rather than lunch. And I get, maybe a lot of that has to do also with the fact that since many people are working, if they eat a big lunch, then they feel like they're going to fall asleep the rest of the afternoon. But I think you can really gauge um, and and then you brought up another important point. I have always eaten breakfast, and I do not understand people who say, well, I skip breakfast. I don't really like to eat breakfast. I don't really feel like eating breakfast. And breakfast is probably the most important meal of the day. So, uh, um, but then again, what do you suggest eating for breakfast? Well, breakfast definitely can be, it's an important meal of the day. Anytime you take in nourishment, it's important. But then again, taking in the right nourishment. For, for a healthy, mature individual, we need to focus on protein because we need to maintain our muscle strength. Studies have shown that mature individuals with the most muscle mass remain living independently longer. Our leg strength correlates to our cognitive function. So the stronger you can keep your legs, the more intact you can keep your brain function. So I promote eating protein however you can get it and however you like it and having that at every single meal. In addition to healthy carbohydrates that are non-starchy, so not loading up on the pastas, not loading up on the bread, having um, carbohydrates that have more fiber in, like a sweet potato, where it's gonna slow down the absorption actually of that carbohydrate as it converts into sugar in the body. And then also healthy fats. And again, on my website, I have, and that PDF that people can download, I have a list of all the different fats 
which ones are healthy and promote health in our body versus which ones are inflammatory. And it's important to know the difference between the two and which ones might start off as a healthy fat, like olive oil, but then when you use it for a high heat thing, like roasting vegetables, it, it becomes an unhealthy fat. So it's important to know those nuances too. But I would say a good breakfast is going to be um, probably a, an amount of protein that's about the size of your hand. And whether that's eggs or chicken or turkey or whatever protein uh, a person likes, and then some carbohydrates and some fat. And that is going to fuel you until your next meal. If you uh, notice that maybe you get hungry in between, then you have to start taking a look at your carbohydrates because when you have a carbohydrate that is that causes your blood sugar to rise quickly and drop off quickly, that can produce hunger. And you wanna keep your blood sugar pretty level and consistent. And you do that with the protein and the fats, which don't raise your blood sugar, and then the carbohydrates that are that have a good amount of fiber in, which keep that blood sugar pretty stable. You know, as you can tell, folks, Jane is just a wealth of information. Her website is for the, the number four dash pillars health, P-I-L-L-A-R-S health. And on that, she has, her downloadable PDF for easy lifestyle hacks for better health. That's a free gift for you. And Jane, um, what do you think, because uh, we have just about, you know, three or four minutes left. What do you think uh, about these eating small meals every, let's say, five times a day? What do you think about that? You know what? I play around with my meals quite often. And sometimes I get, I get busy and I... I aim for four meals a day, four smaller meals a day. Uh, I, I think we are all individual and I wouldn't want to put anyone in a category and say, well, you need to eat five times a day because there are some people that do intermittent fasting, which is a tool and it, it, it can, it should be used as a tool and not a lifestyle of eating, but doing intermittent fasting on maybe a day or a couple days a month, one day a week or a couple days a month, in addition to uh, altering between maybe the four or five meals a day on some of your other days a month. That will continue to keep your body, I don't wanna, I almost wanna use the word guessing at, okay, what's coming at me now? Because when we get stuck in a certain pattern and our body knows what to expect, that's not a good thing. We want to keep our body continually guessing and on its toes, if you will. So intermittent fasting and maybe one meal a day, those types of things are great tools, but we need to have a bunch of tools in our toolbox. You bet we do. Well, folks, uh, we're coming to the end of our interview. And as you can tell, Jane Wenning is just one whole boat full of information. So you need to go to her website for the number four dash pillars health, get your free downloadable PDF, the lifestyle hacks for better health. And Jane, what have we not mentioned that you want to say to our audience in the last minute or so? Okay. So as I was preparing for this interview, Gail, I'm thinking spunky, spunky, spunky. What are your, what, what would, what's spunky to me? And so this is the acronym that I came up with. So your audience is sexy, productive, unique, maybe a little bit naughty. They're knowledgeable and they are youthful. And that is what a spunky old broad is. Wow, I love that. I love every bit of that. Uh, just <laughs> amazing, Jane. You know, I sure hope people pay attention to what you were talking about because you're a living, walking, talking, breathing epitome of what a healthy person over 50 needs to be. And so I just so enjoy this interview with you today, and I hope that our listeners have learned a great deal from it as well, because 
um, you know, they just need to they need to get a whole dose of Jane in their in their <laughs> in their environment. That's what they need. So um, I want to thank you for being with us today. I hope lots of people go to your website, download your your free PDF. Uh, I hope that they take uh, knowledge of the four pillars: recovery, emotional energy, nutrition, and management uh, and movement. Uh, thank you so much for being with us, Jane. It has been an absolute delight and very, very informative. Thank you, Gail. Again, I really appreciate this opportunity, and I, I hope to be able to share my gift with all your audience. Well, I know.